when I did The Shack and why people should not see that film or why they should not have that book or distribute that book, I didn't want to reinvent the wheel. The fact of the matter is there's been some excellent, excellent YouTube clips and other clips available freely online by some very insightful brethren in the faith uh, who have addressed a number of valid issues concerning the shack theologically and doctrinally, and I didn't just want to repeat what they said. I wanted to take a different perspective. Now, what I would say is this. There is one particular brother who's very humorous and very good at what he does. He calls himself, his avatar is Flavius Sarcasticus. Flavius Sarcasticus. And he uses satire to address discernment-related issues, and he's quite good at it and quite entertaining, I must say. But he has substance to what he's saying. His clip on the shack, as well as his material broadly, is very, very good. There's a sister called Sheila Selinsky, has a very excellent and informative clip. Uh, one that really impressed me a lot was someone who approached the problem of the shack from a pastoral perspective. I think he's probably an Arab brother, Pastor uh, Michael Joseph. Uh, his clip is excellent also. He's looking at it again from a pastoral position. Uh, also, Paul Flynn has quite a volume of material on the shack. All of these things are very good, all very good and much more information than, than you're going to get from me because, again, I see no reason to reinvent the wheel. Now, most of these people said many of the things I said. There was obviously a common ground. I said it was involved mysticism, so did they, generally speaking. I also pointed out it was emotionally manipulative and spiritually seductive as they agreed. But they developed some of the doctrinal positions more than I did, which is the reason I didn't do it. It was already done competently. Specifically, the Gnosticism and the way the scripture is mishandled hermeneutically by Paul P. Young. Uh, the universalism, uh, that everyone will somehow be saved but not everyone is in a relationship. Uh, and also, the ancient heresy of Patropassianism, where the stigmata of crucifixion was found on the character in the book that supposedly was God the Father. This is an ancient heresy that the Father suffered in or with Christ on the cross, Patropassianism. All of these things are seriously heretical and very dangerous spiritually, and easily, easily from the Word of God, proven to be heretical. You have a combination of Gnosticism, Universalism, and Patropassianism. I agree with everything. I didn't address those issues in any length because others did it adequately. I wanted to look at aspects that others had not developed that I believe to be coequally important. The one I highlighted yesterday was the fact that he denies propitiation, that he denies, publicly denies, the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Some people want to know when and where this was. Well, it was when the book first became a major seller or bestseller in 2009. Uh, on an interview in Iowa on KAYP Radio in 2009. Transcripts are available on the internet. He directly said that God does not judge sinners. He only judges sin. And that people are not judged for their sin. They're judged by them. Now, there's no denial that sin has consequences and repercussions even in this life. Certainly, God will use the repercussions of sin to correct his children, believers. There's no question that sin has a power to invoke consequences, negative consequences in itself. But to say that that's all and that God will not judge sin is absolutely, absolutely false if you say he will not judge sin by judging the sinner. God judged Jesus in my place. God judged Jesus in your place. Anybody who says otherwise, as William P. Young did, the radio interview in 2009 on KAYP Radio in Iowa, 
anybody who says that is not by scriptural definition a Christian. Now, the fact that he denies propitiation, the fact that he denies substitutionary atonement, the fact that he denies that God poured out his wrath on Jesus instead of on us, that he judges sinners, not just sin, he judges sinners, is not by any scriptural definition a Christian. That should preclude and exclude anything else William P. Young says. The man is not, by scriptural definition, a child of God. At least he does not believe the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, we go to Galatians. He's an anathema, anathemezo. If the angel of God comes with another gospel, don't believe it, he's accursed. This man, unless he changes his false theology and his false gospel, he's accursed and he's publicly misleading people with this. Now that should have been sufficient for anybody. I totally agree with, 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 with uh, Paul Flynn, with uh, Sister Sheila uh, Selinsky. I agree with uh, our, our brother Flavius Sarcasticus. I can't help but uh, <laughs> chuckling when I say it. Uh, I, I, I agree with all of these people. I agree with Eric Barger. I agree with other people who've warned about the shack. I agree with everything that, that was said by Lighthouse Trails. All of them are right. And of course, uh, Pastor Michael Yosef's teaching is, is excellent. Again, from a pastoral <clears throat> point of view, looking at the shack and wanting to protect the sheep from, from drinking the poison, <clears throat> from drinking the Kool-Aid, as it were, uh, in a spiritual sense metaphorically. All that is true. Gnosticism, universalism, patripassionism. But the fact that he does not believe in substitutionary atonement, he does not believe that God will judge sinners, only sin, is a denial of propitiation. He has another gospel to the extent he has a gospel at all. This is the main problem. Once that is brought into play, anything else he says should not even be worthy of consideration by any child of God. He does not believe that Jesus died in your place. Well, Jesus did die in your place, and he died in my place. Praise God. Otherwise, we would experience the eternal wrath of God that he took as a substitutionary atonement on the cross. This man does not believe the gospel and has publicly said so. Well, once again, let's move forward. There is another aspect of the shack that the other watchmen, the other brethren, the other discerning brethren who have sounded warnings from places of different emphasis, have not included. Um, I'm not sure why. I'm not faulting them for not including it. I'm just saying they've focused on the Gnosticism, the Universalism, and the Patripassionism, and rightly so. I have no criticism with what they've done, and I'm not criticizing them for leaving this out. But it is very important. We have to understand something. In the present climate of the church, where spiritual seduction in the last days multiplies. I've warned many times that Eastern religion is permeating Western Christendom. In the secular world, it's the New Age movement, but it's getting into the church. The Toronto experience was Kundalini Yoga, etc. These visualization techniques, contemplative prayer, the Lectio Divina, these things have their origins in Eastern mysticism and medieval superstition. The emergent church is, is, is largely built on it. That's one. The root of these things is Hinduistic. Largely Hinduistic. Again, when the Crusades engaged in the spice trade, they brought Hinduistic influences with them into 
the Western world. Well, that is happening again. There's an influx of Hinduistic influences from the East into the Western world. Something Isaiah warned about in chapter 2, my people are filled with influences from the East. We've warned about this before, concerning Philo, concerning the post lycian Church Fathers, concerning what transpired with the Crusades and the Byzantine Empire and so forth. Well, it's happening again, this invasion by Eastern mysticism of Western Judeo-Christian spirituality. Second thing that's happening today is, of course, so-called Christian feminism. Christian feminism. In the extreme liberal access, we have things like gender-neutral Bibles and addressing God as female and not wanting to uh, uh, include in scriptures, actually censoring the scriptures, things in, in Levitical or Deuteronomic legislation, condemning homosexuality as unnatural and morally abominable, Romans chapter 1 and so forth, people taking these things out, actually taking them out of inclusive editions of the Bible. That's on the extreme. But there's an influx of Christian feminism even into evangelical circles. One very sinister book written by someone whose husband is Roger Forster, a man who I believe has distorted the teachings of Austin Sparks and has come into Dominion theology, and his hermeneutics are absolutely atrocious, is Roger Foster of the Ictus Fellowship in England. His wife, Faith Foster, authored a book called The Femininity of God, The Femininity of God. Now, this is a dangerous book. This is quite a dangerous book. If I was to have a list of books that have done tremendous damage to the body of Christ, the celebration of discipline, which is mysticism masquerading as Christianity, uh, by Richard Forster would be one of them. Another, obviously, would be The Purpose Driven Lie. Another would be The Shack. Another would be The God Chasers, Tommy Tenney. But certainly, uh, another would be Faith Forster's book on the femininity of God. Because it is aimed at subtly seducing evangelicals into a non-scriptural perspective of the male-female relationship in light of the divine nature. The husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. We have an out-of-control woman uh, who goes on diatribes against people like me simply because I say the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Leadership is male. Women can have teaching ministries to other women but should not teach joint congregations. And she reacts against this, obviously in part motivated by her own life circumstances. You'll see her ranting with nonsense on the internet. Uh, and she goes on and on. And although she has essentially the same eschatology as I do, she makes a big issue of the point that I believe the Holy Spirit is the restrainer. And decides I'm a heretic because of this. <laughs> well, the pre-trib people believe that also. And I don't think they're heretics because of that. Um, I just think they're wrong as to the timing of the rapture. But what's really driving her is the fact that she can't teach without her head covered. And and because of her own circumstances, this, this drives her and motivates her, thinking with her emotions explosively. Uh, this kind of feminism is getting into the church among evangelicals. It has not gained a lot of momentum in certain quarters, but in other quarters it most certainly, unfortunately, has. Well... Let's observe the shack in light of these two trends of Christian feminism and of Hinduism. Satan always counterfeits. The Hindu version of the Trinity is called the Holy Triumvirate. The Holy Triumvirate. It is actually a counterfeit of the Trinity involving Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. Uh, has to do the, the celebration of the Hindu feast of Diwali and so forth. But let's look at this nature of the Hindu trinity. What you have is a gender confusion of the deities, of the gods within the Hindu polytheistic trinity. Now, the Judeo-Christian triunity is not polytheistic. The Hindu one really is 
but it becomes very confusing to understand it when you look at the teachings about Vishnu and things of this nature. I would not be the best person to explain this. People say, pastors say that in Hinduism, or missionaries to the Hindus would be more apt than I am, but I've been to India, and I have a lot of fellowship and interaction with Hindu believers, and we do support a work uh, in India, uh, and I'm not ignorant of it, I'm just saying I'm not the most qualified person. But we have people in Moriel who are quite qualified, uh, Tiyat Sand and others who were saved out of it. Uh, we have people who were Brahmins uh, who were saved out of it, who were associated with Moriel, and th they'll tell you exactly what I'm telling you. In the Hindu trinity, Shiva has a female counterpart called Parvi. And somehow a union between the two creates another deity called Lakshmi, Lakshmi, which is a hybrid of the two. This is the Hindu teaching of Arhanarishvara, Arhanarishvara, where a male appears as a female, a female as a male. You'll see this in the images of Shiva in Hinduistic iconography, in their icons of Shiva. Is it a male or is it a female? It's androgynous. This androgynous identity of their gods. Well, in the shack, you have the exact same thing. Jesus referred to the Holy Spirit as a he. In the shack, it's an Asian woman. Uh, God the Father, masculine, paternal, called Papa, but it's a black woman. Uh, it doesn't matter the race, Asian, black, white, Caucasian, doesn't matter, the Hispanic, that, none of that matters. What matters is God is portrayed as human. The Father is portrayed as human in a patropassian way, even, in a patropassian expression of humanity. And the confused gender, male, female, androgynous. He's Papa, but he's a woman. This is exactly what you see in Shiva. This is exactly what you see in the Hindu doctrine of Ardhanarishvara. It is Lakshmi. It is pure Hinduism. Now, that is what William P. Young, cognizantly or incognizantly, knowingly or unknowingly, is doing with the Judeo-Christian trinity or triunity of the Godhead. It's purely Hinduistic. Now again, my blessings and my admiration to those brethren and sisters who've highlighted the Gnosticism, the Universalism, the Patropassianism. From my own perception, however, the first and foremost issue should be, in addition to those things, which are valid and true and demonstrably true, and correctly pointed out by the brethren, the fact that he is a de facto denier of the doctrine of atonement. He does not believe in propitiation. Secondly, and co-equally, if not more importantly, is his view of the triunity of the Godhead and the divine nature, where you have the androgyny, the Hinduistic gender confusion. You do not see this kind of gender confusion in the Godhead in Scripture. The Father is never portrayed as feminine. Never happens. Jesus called the Holy Spirit a he. Jesus was a male. He did, by analogy, at one point, compare himself to a mother hen gathering her chicks, but in no sexual sense, in no double X chromosome sense. <laughs> that's Hinduistic. And that's the shack. The God of the Shack is not the Judeo-Christian God. The God that is the Trinity of the Shack is a Hinduistic God, small g. That's the reality. Once again, my name is Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening.
Blessings dear friends, greetings in Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Prash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't for the sake of brevity uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print through the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of Revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo, Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available in the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you.